sufficient. All right? And His grace, His strength is made perfect in our weakness. And the power of Christ can rest upon us. I don't know about you, but I need the power of Christ in my life. I tend to mess things up. Thank you, Brother Mitchell. Appreciate that. I'm just glad my wife wouldn't say an amen right there. She has more experience than anyone else with that. But so thankful that Jesus knows how to clean up messes. If you have your Bibles, open to the book of 1 John, if you would. 1 John chapter number 5. And it's neat how the Lord works this out. I was planning on preaching this last Sunday night, but then Brother Swain was in town, and he so graciously uh, was willing to preach for us. I thought he did a tremendous job. I appreciate his influence in my life and my family's life, Adrian and I, with him and when Sharon was still living. Just they were dear friends of ours. He taught us many things, and uh, really, you saw from Brother Swain a walk with God. He taught me how to bowl, and uh, I to this day uh, still enjoy bowling. I don't know if I'm very good at it, but I enjoy it. And uh, so many things. We had a good time with him. So it was great to hear him preach last week. This was the first time he had preached in this, in this church since Sharon gone, has gone on to be with the Lord. And so it was very difficult for him. He wasn't sure he was going to do that, but he did, and I thought it was a blessing. But he preached out of Matthew chapter 11, and he preached those, those three invitations, three calls. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, right? But the interesting thing is it ties right in to where I was going to preach anyway. And the Lord was working that out so that we can use kind of that as a platform for tonight, 1 John chapter number 5, as we continue our series in the book of 1 John. Boy, John, what a practical writer, all right, it, obviously through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. But he broke things down so simply for us. He dealt with some real life issues, some real mental blocks that we have in life. And this passage, I believe, is one such mental block. A, a, a thought process that can sneak in, sometimes unawares, Definitely a fiery dart of the devil. That one such of those mental problems is right here, found in the first three verses of 1 John chapter number 5. If you look with me, please, in God's Word, where the Bible says, 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse number 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Oh boy, we've seen that theme in 1 John, have we not? If you love God, you ought to love the saints. You say, well, pastor, they're not always very lovely. Uh, last time I checked, as I read the book of 1 John, that wasn't one of the qualifications. If you feel like loving another Christian, you can. If you, if you think they're lovely in your own opinion, then you can. No, he just says, if you love God, you're going to love those around you who are the Christians. And if we believe in the love of God like we ought to from the Bible, that extends to the whole world. Because my Bible says, for God so loved the world. That's what my Bible says, at least, and I think yours does as well. Also quoted by John, right, in John 3.16. And so, clearly, this theme of loving each other is a reoccurring theme. You say, well, Pastor, you keep on saying that. Well, John keeps on saying that. The Holy Spirit. Maybe, just maybe, we need that sometimes in a church. Sometimes in a church, we get disgruntled with one another. Sometimes at the pastor, that's okay. I'll, if not, I'll give you lots of reasons along the way to get disgruntled with me. But sometimes it's someone else. But beyond that, we need that for our homes. All right, if you're married to a Christian, you ever wonder, wow, do I have to love them today? You don't know what they were like today. I love them yesterday, but today? He says, of course, of course. Now, I digress, though. Everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Verse number two, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. And here is the thought in verse number three for tonight. The thought that can sneak in, the, 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 the thought that, that, that can distract us from our mission serving God. For this is the love of God, verse number three, that we keep his commandments. For, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments commandments. Well, I didn't know that Jesus gave any commandments. I thought the commandments were just in the Old Testament. And once Jesus came, remember, he struck down the law. I don't know that Jesus gave any commandments. Didn't Jesus just talk about grace? Didn't Jesus just talk about really, uh, and they'll say it this way, you can do whatever you want to do and God still loves you? Well, the fact is that a child of God, God will always love me. Right? There's nothing I can do to stop the love of God. We preach the whole message on that. Go back, watch it on YouTube, or just read your Bible. All right, same truth. Nothing I can do can stop the love of God. But here it says, this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. I don't know about you, but I don't like rules. Do you? Speed limits. 
they're for everyone else. But they're not for everyone else because when someone else keep a, keeps the speed limit, they're in my way. So they're for everyone else when I'm not around. I don't like lines on the road. I want to drive wherever I want to. I got to go all around here. I got to go around the Great Lakes to get to Chicago. I want to go through the Great Lakes. I don't like rules. Go to the airport. I want to fly with what I want to fly with. We don't like rules. There's rules everywhere we look. There are rules. Stand on the X at the store. Nowhere else may you stand. Only on the X that is marked for you. X marks the stop. Follow the arrows. And I don't think those things are bad, all right? I'm, I'm not making fun of rules. I'm making the fact that none of us really like the rules. But we do like our rules for other people. All right? Uh, uh, if you can't have your money ready when you check out, you'd be in a different line. Not in my line. My line is the money ready line. That's my rule. Yet the Bible says that this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And then he gives us that last phrase in verse number three, and his commandments are not grievous. The devil's going to come in, your thoughts will come in and say, listen, living for God is the hard way. Living for Jesus, that's the difficult path, yet my Bible says, no, 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 that's the easy path. That's the road that I want to be on with God's help. We'll look at that topic tonight, that thought tonight, not too heavy, not too heavy. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the time that we have. Lord, I pray that you would help us to listen to your spirit. Lord, speak through your word in our hearts. Lord, show us areas that need to be touched by your gospel and your grace. Lord, help us to respond to you and to be in tune to you. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. My wife and I discovered a few years back that what we like to do together is buy houses. I'm not sure why we do this. We've, I think, owned six houses now and remodeled four of them. Three by myself, or three, well, one by myself and the three with, with my wife. I don't know why we do this. But through the years, you've seen these TV shows on remodeling houses, right? They're all over the place. They're a dime a dozen now. It's amazing what can happen in 28 and a half minutes. Amazing. Whole houses can be torn back to the studs, rewired, countertops, found, located, and cut. Contractors can be called, talked to, paid, and work accomplished in 28 and a half minutes. It is unbelievable. Exteriors can be ripped, uh, 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 ripped out of brick and laid with siding, three or four different kinds. Roofs can be torn off and put back on. Whole dormers and additions can be added in 28 and a half minutes. It truly is a miracle. It can't take longer than that. And because of that, many people have decided to remodel houses. How hard can that be? You should have warned me before we did it to our first house. You should have said, Pastor Howell, what are you thinking? And I would have responded, I'm not. The second house, I knew what I was thinking. The third house, I knew I done lost my mind. The Lord brought us this last house, and truly is a blessing from God. We claim Psalm 118.25, this is the Lord's doing it, it's marvelous in our eyes. All right, God did that. But I wasn't excited for the last house. I didn't want this last house. My wife along the way said, well, why aren't you excited? I said, honey, I'm not excited because I know what this means. I know what kind of time and kind of stress in my life. I know that after I get done here at the office and working on sermons, getting ready, we're right in the middle of, of course, transitioning with Pastor Let. I'm going there and, and we're pulling up staples, we're pulling up carpet, and we're ripping off wallpaper, and we're painting, and we're mudding, and then we'll do it all over again because that's just the one closet. So, honey, I know what kind of time that takes, and many of you do that as well, and the, and the hours, and, and what you feel like the next day when you drag yourself into the office, and like, your shoulder doesn't work like it used to. This whole manual labor thing, that's why I went to college, I thought. <laughs> fix, a har fix a house, you say? That's hard. No, 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 no. Living in a tent would be hard. Living in a house is easy. See, sometimes what we view as the hard way is actually the right way. It's the easy way. A few late nights, a few sore shoulders, and an empty pocketbook is still better than living under a tree out in the backyard. 
last few summers, the kids and I have, and the, the whole family, not the kids and I, the whole family, we've weeded a field with a hoe. And that's hard. And sometimes it's hard. It's hard work sometimes. Sometimes. But that's easier than starving to death. As you can tell, I'm not in danger of that either. You see, we look sometimes at life, we look at God's ways, we say, that's the hard way. You, you, mean, you mean apologize to that person because of what I said? That's too hard. What will they say? I can't do that. I'll just ignore and pretend it never happened. That's the easy way. But God says, no, you follow my path and you apologize. That's the hard way, but that's the, actually the easy way. Read your Bible every morning, spend time with God. That's hard. You mean wake up early? Have an alarm go off? No one likes the sound of the alarm. No one. And if you do, don't come up and tell me after church. <laughs> if you do, I will pray that the Lord will strike your alarm to go off tonight at 1 a.m. See if you like it then. Waking up early, that's, that's hard. Spending time with God. Don't you know what I could be doing with that time I spend with God? That's the hard way. No, no. That's the easy way. It's hard to have your soul thirsty and dry in this land and this time. That's the hard way. I can't be generous, Pastor Howe. I can't be generous with the church and others. I'm going to run out of money. That's the hard way if I'm generous. No, 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 my friend. That's the easy way. Saving up for yourself, you find out that's the hard way. Because you may end up with a whole lot of toys, but be empty right here. You see, God says that His way has some commandments, but His way is not hard. Understand this, that the devil never plays fair. The devil never plays fair. He doesn't play by his own rules. He has no rules. He, he plays in every way to deceive, to disrupt, and to distract a Christian. He wants to deceive, disrupt, and distract the Christian. He wants you off your path, God's path, His way, which... And he'll say, if it, if it works by telling you it's a hard way, it doesn't matter to him. He wants you off the path. I read this account. It was happened in 1896. It was a while ago. There was a boxing championship, and Norman Kidd McCoy was the welterweight boxing champion. In one of his fights, in 1896, he learned that his opponent was deaf. McCoy discovered this, and as they were nearing the end of the third round... McCoy stepped back and pointed to his opponent's corner, indicating that the bell had rung. When his opponent turned his head, they tell me that McCoy unloaded a powerful blow and knocked him out. Apparently it wasn't fair, but it was effective and he won. We would be crying foul, would we not? Understand that the devil never plays fair. God issues rules and commands for us, not because, not because He wants to make our life hard, but to do a few things in our life. Number one, He wants to show us that, one, we can't possibly be good enough. We can't possibly be good enough. Love my enemy? Do good to them that despitefully use me and persecute me? Did you know what you're asking of me? I just recall, if I, if I give you or help you to recall, when the disciples asked Jesus about marriage. In the Mo Mosaic Law, there was a clause for divorce. Jesus talked about that. He said, well, this was not God's plan, but out of the hardness of your hearts, God permitted this. The disciples said, well, what is it supposed to be? And, and God went on to say that you're supposed to just stay committed and, and stay through that. The disciples' response, it's better not to marry See, the, the, the commandments are there to show us that we're not good enough, but God's grace is good enough. To show us, first of all, that we can't do it, no matter how hard we, how, how hard we try. God's rules and commandments are there to show us how good God is and how, what His grace is like. It's also for us to demonstrate our love for Him. I'm going to notice three quick things tonight from this passage that I see in these three verses. First of all, we see in this passage the foundation for salvation. The foundation for salvation. Don't ever forget the foundation for your salvation, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ in your life. Calvary covers it all. 
What a tremendous joy we have in salvation. Joy in the gift. Joy in seeing souls saved. Foundation for salvation is found in Jesus Christ. Everyone that is born of God. So the verse number one tells us. It is a wonderful privilege to be born a child of God. Nicodemus came to Jesus in the night. And he said, how can I be born again? And God and Jesus described to him what belief and faith looks like. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in Acts, and thou shalt be saved. Foundation for salvation. Don't forget, Christian, whether you've been saved one day, one week, one month, one year, or 100 years, that Jesus is the foundation for my salvation. I sing the song, Jesus paid it all. Does it move your heart? Does it touch you? Or is it just one more song? Apathy, what a distraction for a Christian. Those songs, Pastor, we wish they were a little bit peppier. We wish they had a little more tune to them. Why don't you listen to the words? Don't you listen to what message is going on? Always the same? What a powerful truth. You wake up tomorrow, Jesus is the same. You wake up on Tuesday morning, guess what? He's still there, He's still the same, and He's still in control of everything. Always the same. What a truth. Sit there. Or stand there, looking for while people are singing. Let it sink in. The foundation for salvation. I'm so glad I serve a living Savior. And he's a risen Savior. No matter what day I, what moment I pray, He hears me. Foundation for salvation. I also see in this passage though the fellowship in salvation. I mentioned it before briefly. The fellowship of the saints, love one for another. That's one thing I love about First Baptist Church, Fellowship of the Saints. When we first came back May the 17th, I said, hey, we've got to be a little careful, you know, social distancing, and you're, you're doing all right, but it is hard to keep you people apart from each other. It's a full-time job for a pastor. All you want to do is talk to each other and fellowship. I'm glad for that. Now, we still ought to do it outside right now, all right? And, and I, the times are, we're moving toward phase two, but, but I, it's a blessing. Be able to come to the house of God with the people of God and actually have some friends. People who care about you, love you. But you can say, hey, would you pray for this? And they will. And they will. Sure, we forget sometimes. Now, this is what I do. I write those things down and put them in my phone. Because if not, I will forget. Then when you come back and say, Pastor, did you pray? But my phone helps me remember. Remember, I don't know how the cell phone works, but I use it. I use it. I'm so thankful for the fellowship of the saints. Fellowship is the result of salvation. Without salvation, we wouldn't have this fellowship. You look at cultures or places that don't have Jesus Christ. They do not have the love that is displayed where Christ is involved. What a blessing to the fellowship. Boy, with the fellowship of the saints, we can eat together. We can cry together. We can laugh together. We can weep together. We can soul win together. We can serve together. We can do these things together. Oh, two is better than one. Absolutely. What a joy that I come here and I get to see your smiling faces. And many of you have joined us online as well. I often go back after the service and look through comments and say, oh, what a, what, a, what a privilege. And many of you online will comment amen after a particular good song or something that touched your heart. What a blessing for fellowship. It's a result of salvation, and it is a benefit of salvation. You see, going to church, that's hard. I got to get up for my nap. I got I to gotta come to church when it's sunny outside. Remember, we're thinking, that's the hard way. No, no, no. That's the easy way. Coming among friends, among family. What a blessing. His commands are not grievous. Amen. Yet sometimes, oh boy, Wednesday night, going back to church. Sometimes we're tired. I don't take lightly the fact that you coming from your job right here Wednesday nights, you know, the summer Tuesday nights starting this week. It's a commitment. It's a commitment. Put in a full day. Many of you work very hard labor type jobs. First time you get to sit down is here at church. You can fall asleep on me. You won't bother me. I have it coming. I've slept through messages before. 
and you reap what you sow. But remember, don't ever get distracted by the word. That's the hard way. That's the easy way. Starving your soul is the hard way. Not having your spiritual gas tank filled up, that's the hard way. Come when the church fills up your gas tank. I don't know about you, but I go to the gas station. Why? So I don't have to use the E. E doesn't mean empty. E means walk. If I wanted to walk, I'd put my walking shoes on. But that's why I have a vehicle, so I can drive. One time a few years back, I don't know about you men, but sometimes I, when I get in a vehicle, I want to see how far it'll go. Anybody else nuts like that? Come on, some of you men, you know, right? You see, okay, well, the light went on. What does that... Now, ladies, different for you ladies. Some of you ladies, you don't want to know how far it goes. You just think you can go a little bit further. All right, oh, that's fine. What did it turn on? Yesterday. Where were you, Detroit? Oh, boy, you're walking. But us men, we like, come on, okay, click reset the odometer. I'm going to see how far I can go. It was one of those such times we just got a van, or our second van, our silver van. How far can I go? And boy, I was doing well, 25, 26 miles. This is tremendous. I was coming on Dixie Highway right under the overpass. Of course, you know the speedway, for loves with their speedways on the left-hand side if you go under the overpass. And I got almost there. Almost only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. And here I am on Dixie Highway. And I ran out of gas. I can see the gas station. My blinker was on. That's how close I was. And there I was, no one to help, no one to call that close. And uh, opened the door, waited for an opening, and began to push that car. Car's coming this way and that way. Your heart's beating 100 miles an hour. But I got 26 miles. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dr. Martin, or Brother Martin. Thank you, Brother Martin. Come to the church, fills up the gas tank. You know that sometimes coming to church, the most important thing you're here may not be maybe the sermon, though that's important. It's God's word. It may be that God has another plan for you at church. Maybe your job tonight is to encourage someone else to fill up their gas tank. A one another command. Maybe you're here tonight because someone else needs your encouraging word, your smile, your love as a Christian. Sometimes it's a, I'm so glad you're here. And we don't know how God can take those little phrases, just being in God's plan and showing his love to other Christians to fill up someone else's gas tank. Could be the song. Could be the congregational song. Could be a special song. But come in the church, refills my gas tank. I love being here among the family of God. There's a fellowship and salvation. But last night, not only do I see a foundation for salvation and fellowship in salvation, I see freedom after salvation. Freedom after salvation. John Newton. John Newton, who was once a, a slave driver, he wrote the song Amazing Grace. His tombstone, I'm told, reads this. John Newton, the clerk, once an infidel... A servant of slaves in Africa was by the rich mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. Grace did not free him to serve no master, but a new master. Amen. You see, there's freedom after salvation. This is the love of God that we keep his commands, commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. Where grievous means heavy. Or his commands are not grievous too heavy. If we were at the gym, they would be weight, but they wouldn't be the heavy weight. They'd still be some weight following commandments. It does take some discipline. A disciple of Jesus Christ it takes discipline to be here, discipline to read your Bible, discipline to curb your tongue, discipline to curb your appetites for things that you shouldn't have, discipline to apologize. It's lifting some weight. All right, It's some commandments, but that word grievous means it's not the heavy ones. The heavy ones are the broken homes. The heavy ones are the destroyed careers. The heavy ones are the wasted health. Those are the heavy ones. There's freedom from harshness. Romans 6, Paul says this, But God be thanked, 
that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Someone said this, sin at the door of your life is more persistent than a Jehovah Witness, more tenacious than a vacuum cleaner salesman, more widespread than Girl Scouts selling cookies, and more intrusive than a burglar. And sadly, sin has more takers, meets a higher quota, and is more successful than any solicitor or door-to-door -door salesman there has ever been. His ways are not the hard ways. These ways are the hard ways. And yet, time and time again, and Christian after Christian begins to believe the lie from the devil. You know what? His way is a hard way. Don't be so dedicated. All right? Be, be somewhat dedicated. Don't be so generous. Just be mostly generous. Don't, don't go crazy in this Christian walk thing. All right? People are going to think you're weird, and, and you don't want that co-worker to think you're weird. Because if they think you're weird, you won't be able to share the gospel. And if they think you're normal, then you'll have a platform for the gospel. The problem is it's the opposite of what my Bible says. My Bible says, you are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill. All right, my Bible says that when people see your good works, they glorify your Father, which is in heaven, or the salt of the earth, all things that are in contrast to other things. Yet that little whisper, that little slanderer, the devil comes in, says, no, no, this is, this is the easy path, the path that I'll give you. And he's persistent. He says, listen, just back off just a little bit. What will, what will pull him back a little bit really hurt you? In fact, you'll have more rest. And with that more rest, you'll be better equipped to serve. Listen, if you have a, this particular degree, that'll be a good degree. And then think about what you can do to send missionaries to missions, to, to foreign countries. Take this path. This is, the, this is the easy path. That's the hard path. And yet God says, listen, my way, there are commands there, but my way is not grievous. The choice, though, is whether to believe God or anything else. That's always the choice, whether I walk by faith or by sight. Walking by sight, this path looks easier. More money in my life looks easier. I don't know about you, but I never have an overabundance of money. I have more than I need. But I never say, wow, I have all this money and I just can't spend it in my lifetime. Maybe you have that problem. Now, I, am I have more than I need. More than I need. I have way too many toys in my life, and there were expensive toys. Oh, for the days where a hot well would have sufficed. But those days are long gone. You say, oh, this is, this is easy path. This will make life easier. If I had that money, then, then I could fix my car. And that would please the Lord. I'd go soul winning then. If I had more money, then, then I, could, I could give. Yet yeah, that's not the easy path. This, God's path, is the easy pass, path. Someone said about the devil, he promises the best but pays with the worst. He promises honor and pays with disgrace. He promises pleasure and pays with pain. He promises profit and pays with loss. He promises life and pays with death. Temptations are certain to ring your doorbell, but it's your own fault if you ask him to stay for dinner. His ways, his commands are not grievous. Freedom from harshness and freedom from hardship. Matthew chapter 11, where Brother Swain preached last week, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest under your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Don't forget that a yoke was a wooden piece, a 
cross that would tie two animals together. Attached to a plow or cart, always for a purpose of work. A yoke allows two animals to share a load and pull together. Primarily in Bible times, used to plow fields and pull wagons. Remember, we are not in bondage to Jesus. We get to serve with Jesus. He says, take my yoke. Not as a master, but as a friend. We are co-laborers with God, Paul says. We get to be a laborer with Jesus Christ. He is the best co-laborer you could ever have. We have the best teammate who is the ultimate secret weapon, who draws up the best game plan. Reminded of elementary school was the sixth grade. During that time, we were playing football, two-hand touch football on the playground. Mostly boys, a couple girls, like most, I guess, playground games go. I was with another person. I remember the team that was out. I remember the quarterback that day was Mike Vandekar. I remember it like it was... 20 plus years ago. I don't remember the exact game plan, but like you do at elementary football game time, you huddle, right? You get together and you draw it out on the hand, all right? You run there, you run there, you run there, and you go deep. That was the plan. The plan was for me to go deep that day. They went hike, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, this person ran this way, this person this way, and I just ran as fast as I could, turn around. Mike had thrown the ball perfectly. Right there, I was able to catch it, run across, and we won that day. Probably one of the only times that I helped win the game in football. Of course, to cheer him because football, that matters at recess. That matters at recess. That goes down in the, in the annals of time as football at recess. Those games matter. Right? Right, Johnny? They matter. Clapping hands, high fives. We're a whole team. We're a whole team, and you and I on this team get to have Jesus as a teammate. He, he, he wants us to serve with him. He didn't pick us last. He, he didn't say, oh, okay, and uh, okay, you take the girls, we'll take JD. He didn't do that. We love him because he first loved us. He picked us first. And then he says, listen, come on to my team. I'll give you the strength for your legs to run, for your arms to work. I'll give you the finances to to do all you need to do. I'll draw up a masterful game plan. All you got to do is follow the arrows. Whether you're the bottle cap or the piece of stick or the straw on the ground. It's a masterful plan. And Jesus says, by the way, while you're running this plan, I'm going to be with you every step of the way. If you get tired, I'll pick you up. As you get tired, remember my strength will give you strength to soar like eagles. You will run and not be weary. You will walk and not faint. That's the teammate we have. And he says, listen, just follow my plan. And we have the audacity. We have the complaining spirit to say, but God, your plan stinks. Your plan is hard. I'm going to go on my own plan. And would you make it work out for me, please? I'm going to do my own plan, and when you don't make my plan work out, I'll be mad at you. Jesus says, listen, my plan is tremendous. My yoke, you'll be right alongside me. I'll serve with you. You won't have to pull very much, just a little bit. I'll pull the rest of the weight for you. And just in case you want, I'm the creator of the universe. I'm the savior of all mankind, their sins. Nothing can stop me. Hell, the grave, the devil, nothing can stand in my way. And when I throw the football, all you have to do is put your arms up and catch it. And even sometimes, people will say, look what a job you did. What do we say? Boy, I didn't do anything. I being in the way, the Lord led me. I was along for the ride. I I don't know how this happened. I don't know how I caught that football. I can't catch football. My life depended on it. But Jesus threw the perfect football. He's the best teammate. So where are you at, Christian? What are your burdens like tonight? If they're hard, they're not from God. 
His way is easy. But for some of us, it's just a shift in our mentality. Some of us have bought into the lie of the devil. Hey, this is an easy path, but Jesus says, God says, no, my path, my game plan, my strength, my yoke, my love is the right path. Stay with Jesus. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your grace. Well, sometimes we are tempted to think that your way is hard. Lord, help us, forgive us. Lord, may we stay with you. How about it, friend? Here tonight or online, have you listened to the, those whispers? Have you given in to those thoughts? Boy, this seems hard. Has God touched your heart tonight? His way is perfect. His plan is is right and his burden is not too heavy say brother how would you pray for me tonight as you spoke god spoke to me maybe you need to get back in the, the trenches maybe you need to get back in the low yoke with jesus who would say with an upraised hand pastor how would you pray for me tonight as you spoke god spoke to me and i want to make sure i stay on that path with jesus I've been thinking it was hard, but God spoke to me. Who would say, yes, pray for me tonight? Hands all over. Amen. Amen. Who else? Amen. Maybe you're here tonight or online, and you don't know that you have a home in heaven. My friends, you're still serving the devil. I want you to know that God loves you. And he sent his son Jesus to die for you. And if you trust in Jesus and his shed blood on the cross, he will forgive your sins. All of them. Past, present, and future. And you then get to serve Jesus, being then made free from sin, servants of righteousness. Just a moment, we'll stand to our feet and the altar will be open. If you're not sure on your way to heaven, you're here tonight, would you come forward? We'd love to open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure you have a home in heaven. If God's touched your heart, you can come forward and bend a knee. Response to him, Lord, bless this time of invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. As we stand to our feet, the piano's already playing, the altar's open. If you need to do business with God, do it now. The Lord touch your heart, please. Respond to him. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. My commands are not grievous, God said. Folks praying now, won't you respond to him? My friend, if you're online and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, the Bible says we're all sinners, but that God loved us and he sent his son Jesus to die for us. The Bible says, but God commendeth, or he showed his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Jesus Christ came onto this earth, lived a sinless life. Died on the cross. He was buried and rose again the third day. And he's alive. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. My friend, if you have never trusted Christ today, you can trust him right where you're at. You may be at home, you may be in your car, you can trust him right there. And pray a simple prayer, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, that he was buried and rose again. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and him alone. And my friend, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you trust him tonight? right where you're at, whether you're here in the auditorium or at home or somewhere else watching this broadcast. Could you trust him now? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Tell him, he'll hear you. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, that he was buried and rose again. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and him alone. My friend, if you have asked Jesus to save you, the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And my friend, if you just prayed that and meant that, the Bible says that Christ forgave you from your sins. It's the best news we know here in the whole wide world. The Bible calls it the gospel, the good news. I'd love to rejoice with you if you just prayed that. If you're here, your head's bowed and eyes closed. If you're here and you just prayed that, you say, Pastor How, I just prayed that. I never prayed that before. Would you slip your hand up, slip it back down. I'll call no more attention to you than to anyone else. 
If you're joining us online and you just prayed that, would you do me a favor and leave me a message or drop me a note on your screen? There'll be a phone number, a website, an email address. Quick note, Pastor, I, I just prayed that I meant that. I'd love to send you a free book. I'll help you grow as a Christian. Lord, thank you for working in hearts and lives. Lord, thank you for your gospel. Thank you for your way, which is the easy way for your path. Lord, bless these folks who have indicated they were touched by your word tonight. May they walk in grace through your power and your spirit.